Chelsea McKinley is the plant healthcare specialist at the U.S. Botanic Garden. She manages the Integrative Pest Management Program, helping gardeners identify and solve plant health issues in our collections. Chelsea has worked at the garden since 2014, previously working as a gardener in the horticulture collections team and caring for the medicinal and Mediterranean plant collections. Welcome, Chelsea. Thank you. It's good to be here, Grace. Awesome. Before we get started, can you tell us a little bit more about integrated pest management and and how that transpires at the U.S. Botanic Garden? Sure. Yeah. So specifically at the conservatory, uh, we do a lot to um, try to minimize how many pesticides we use, which is a part of integrated pest management. Uh, we, in order to do that, we uh, monitor our pest populations. We uh, you might see these yellow sticky cards hanging around um, in the houses. If you visit the gardens, these help us monitor our uh, flying pests. So not all of our pests will stick to these cards, but our flying pests will. And so we can count them. Uh, I change them out on a weekly basis and do a little count. Uh, and I keep track of those numbers so that we can kind of monitor population levels and see when our uh, certain pests are increasing so that we know when we might need to do a uh, pesticide application rather than trying to uh, kill all the pests all the time. We wait until they're at a level in which uh, they might be doing visible damage to our plants. Um, and then we, that's when we typically treat um, for some of our other crawling pests that might not fly or stick to those cards. I'll visually scout plants. I'll walk around on a weekly basis and um, check on things, look under leaves, look um, at the base of plants, look in the crown of, of trees and things like that, and uh, try to see if we have other pests present in the conservatory that we need to treat, because sometimes they hide. So that that's a really good um, thing to practice when you're at home with your, your plants at home is to look at them on a regular basis, look under the leaves, look closely at them to see if you see any pests on them. That way you can catch uh, a pest population early on um, and treat it when it's a little bit easier to treat than say like once your plant is covered in spider mite webbing and then it becomes a little more difficult to treat. So another part of integrated pest management is knowing when to treat certain pests. Uh, like for example, mealybugs and scale, they have uh, crawler life stages. So they're like when the eggs hatch, they're very, very tiny and they crawl around on the plant. That tends to be the life stage that's easiest to treat. So we try to target applications for when we know those life stages are out and about. Um, and then also for integrative pest management, we do a lot of cultural control. So we will physically remove heavily infested plants or uh, leaves or branches, things like that. Um, if we find that we're able to do that without harming the plant itself, uh, we will also sometimes modify the environment. Um, for example, a lot of diseases, plant diseases are spread through moisture. So if we find that we have a lot of leaf moisture in an area and we're getting some leaf diseases, we try to let those leaves dry out. So we try to focus on cultural controls. Uh, we scout and we monitor plants to ensure proper timing of pesticides when we have to use pesticides. And then we also use biological control agents here at the garden. So we will use um, entomopathic nematodes which will kind of hang out on the soil surface and then um, attack thrips pupa in the soil. We also release cryptolamus beetles, which will crawl around. Their common name is mealybug destroyers. So they fly around um, and eat mealybugs. And their larvae actually look like giant mealybugs. So kind of a wolf in sheep's clothing to some degree. So they'll crawl around on the plants and eat mealybugs. And we also release a variety of different uh, predatory mites, which feed on various other pests, uh, like spider mites, thrips, um, and uh, white fly eggs as well. So we try to um, use a variety of different control methods for controlling pests at the conservatory, uh, in addition to also um, using pesticides when we decide that it's necessary. Thank you, Chelsea. And in the conservatory, are there any unique pest challenges that you're facing right now? 
Sure. Yeah. I mean, there's always something. <laughs> it's it's hard to grow a collection inside um, and not have uh, issues, especially when we're growing plants outside of their native range. So, you know, trying to grow desert plants in the mid-Atlantic, we're going to have pest problems or Mediterranean plants in the mid-Atlantic, we're going to have problems. Uh, but that's why we use IPM. So currently in um, the uh, garden court in the tropics, we have a little bit of white fly issue. So we've been tracking the pest populations of the white fly with these sticky cards. And um, we've set uh, kind of an action threshold for pesticide application. So I do a weekly count of the white flies. And then once we once it reaches a certain level, then that's when we know that we need to take action. And then we discuss what sort of um, pesticides or control measures we are going to take to do that. We've also been doing regular releases of predatory mites, which feed on white fly eggs and uh, crawlers. And then we've also um, been using various other beneficials to try to control this particular pest. Thank you. And can you tell us a little bit about the room you're in now? Sure, yeah, this is the Mediterranean house. So uh, I used to take care of this house. I've, I planted a lot of the plants that are in here. Um, and one of the challenges that we faced early on in this house um, is that some of the plants came in with Phytophthora, which is a very uh, tricky plant disease to treat because it has a survival spore um, that will linger in the soil. So most fungicides will only kill the active mycelia, so the actively growing fungal material that are in the soil, but they won't kill the survival spores. So we can you know, do fungicide applications to treat for the actively growing mycelia, but we can't uh, uh, kill all of the, the survival spores. So we have it pop up occasionally. We have been using um, uh, beneficial mycorrhizal products to protect the plants that are currently in here that are not infected. So we will do regular applications of like um, through watering. So we mix it up in a bucket and we water it into the soil and uh, the, my the mycorrhizal products will um, kind of fill that niche in the soil uh, rhizosphere that um, uh, the um, pathogen would otherwise try to kind of infiltrate. So by filling that niche with a beneficial mycorrhiza, it makes the plants less susceptible to um, infection by uh, the Phytophthora pathogen. Wow, that is so cool. It's interesting to think of ecology as like a pest management tool. So it's very cool. Yeah, and that's a big part of IPM is, is looking at um, the growing environment as a whole and using cultural methods as well as, you know, biologicals and everything and chemicals sometimes to ensure the proper health of the plant. It's not just about controlling the pest. It's also ensuring that your plant is healthy because the, if your plant's not healthy, then it's going to be more susceptible to, um, infection or, um, uh, 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 pests and other things like that, just like humans, right? Like when we're not healthy, we're more likely to get sick. So same with your plants. Absolutely. Well, we'll open it up to audience questions and we've got one right here, which is how do you know when and how to treat? Is there a good resource to check before you treat your plants? Um, yeah, I think it would depend on what it is that you're treating, right? So, uh, you know, like the example I gave with scale and mealybugs, you would want to treat when the crawlers are active. Um, maybe for the home gardener, that's not quite as feasible. So you would try to just physically remove them when you see them. Um, but yeah, it really depends on what you're treating. Uh, there are a lot of great resources through university extension offices. So if, you know, you're Googling or searching online for information on a particular pest, um, if you find some a website from a university, it's probably pretty good information, so I would trust it. Um, 
other websites may not be quite as reliable in terms of their um, information and accuracy as well as safety, especially if they're recommending certain pesticides. Um, I would err on the side of caution and, and just uh, use that sort of information from um, .edu websites. Thanks, Chelsea. And our next question is, what is the best way to treat fungus gnats without harming the plant? And I can pull up a photo of some fungus gnats as well in case folks sure. are familiar. Yeah, so uh, if you wanna pull up that uh, picture. There we go. So for those of you that aren't familiar, fungus gnats are these tiny little flies. When you look up close to them, they kind of look like mosquitoes a little bit, like very small mosquitoes. Um, and they, uh, the adults will fly around. So you'll see the adults before you see um, any other signs typically. And uh, the, they, the larva, uh, which look like little tiny grubs, live in the soil and they will feed on the roots of your plants, which can then cause issues for your plants later on, right? Because then if the roots are compromised and they're, the plants are less able to take up water and nutrients, so they kind of slowly suffer over time. Um, the good thing about fungus gnats is that typically it's an issue with, um, or you can typically manage fungus gnats through uh, modifying the culture of your plant. So if, uh, say, you let your plant dry out a little bit more in between each time you water it, so letting that top um, like half inch to an inch of soil, depending on the size of the pot, you know, the larger the pot, the more soil you're going to want to let it dry out on top uh, before you water it again. Um, and then also making sure that your pot, your planted pot isn't uh, sitting in a saucer full of water for a long period of time. So if, um, say you water it and then there's a bunch of water at the bottom and the water sits there for a really long period of time, that's going to make the soil overly moist and thus produce an environment that's more conducive for fungus gnats and fungus gnat infection because the larvae tend to just kind of thrive in really moist environments. So if you um, don't let your soil become super moist for long periods of time, then they're less likely to become an issue. If you do have a huge fungus net problem, I'd say you know first address the watering issues, make sure that you're allowing your plants to freely drain. Sometimes I recommend people, um, you know, if they're watering their plants, to bring them into say their bathtub or their shower and water them in there and let them sit for a period of time to let all of the water drain out before then moving them back to their spot and placing them on a saucer that's going to reduce how much free moisture is sitting at the bottom of the pot. Um, and then, you know, letting the soil surface dry out a bit in between watering. And then you can also try um, applying a, a pretty thick layer of dimentaceous earth. Some home gardeners have found that that's fairly use, useful. Uh, because that will, it has to completely cover the soil surface. So you can't, you have to apply it thick enough that you don't see any soil because it's a, it's a physical uh, control method for fungus gnats. So the adults will come down, they'll land on the dimentaceous earth, trying to lay their eggs in the soil and they'll get covered in the dimentaceous earth. So it has to physically contact them in a, in a quantity large enough for it to, uh, it kind of like cuts up their um, their cuticle and their external membranes, and then it causes them to dry out and die. Um, it will also coat any adults that are emerging from the soil. So over time, you'll see a reduction. To uh, also control the adult fungus gnats, you can use a sticky card like the one pictured here and kind of place it among your plants and that will physically capture a lot of your adults, but you need to combine it with these other control methods. Otherwise, you know, it's not going to completely solve the problem. Uh, you can also buy nematodes online. Uh, you wanna make sure you get them from a reputable source, but the species that targets uh, fungus gnat larva is a Steinernema feltiae. Uh, so that particular species of nematode 
um, will uh, target fungus nut larvae in the soil. So what you can do is kind of create a solution of it in a bucket, dredge all of your house plants, um, and um, you know you kind of have to wait a little while to see results, but you can combine it with those other control methods as well. Thanks, Chelsea. And we've got a question. This person is asking if they purchase soil and they think it's already infested with fungus gnats, um, what should they do? And if someone buys soil and they think it already has a pest or pathogen, what's the next step? Yeah, that, that is really tricky. Um, and that's why you do want to source uh, really quality ingredients, really, really good quality soil ingredients from good. That's why it is kind of worth it to pay top dollar for, for better uh, potting soil brands. Um, and when you are buying potting soil, I'd recommend that you make sure that the bag doesn't have any holes in it. Um, that it's not saturated because that can mean that there's a hole in it if, say, it's sitting outside and you buy it from um, a nursery or something like that and the bag is really moist. That can mean that some water got in, maybe some fungus gnats got in, something like that. So make sure to buy good quality soil that's not compromised. Um, but even then, if, say, you think that it might still have fungus gnats, which is possible, um, there are some home methods. You could try microwaving it. Uh, that's a method of sterilizing it. Um, you know, it's kind of hit or miss, but um, I think there's some, some good instructions online in terms of like how long to microwave certain amounts of soil, um, which is more practical for the home gardener because you, you all are working with smaller amounts of soil. Obviously, like for us, <laughs> we aren't microwaving soil because that would take a long time. Um, so we try to just source uh, um, good quality soil. Perfect. Thank you. Um, our next question here is, how do you know when leaf drop is normal? I have an avocado tree that shows a ton of growth, flowers, and then drops a bunch of leaves. Is this typical of the plant overall? Um, it's hard to say without looking at it. Um, uh, leaf drop is somewhat normal, but typically, um, you know, avocados are evergreen, so it's not like a deciduous tree where you would expect a ton of leaf drop all at once. What could be happening is that it's putting a lot of energy into flowering, and then um, it's using up kind of its available nutrients, which causes it to drop a lot of leaves in the process. So it's kind of like sucking the nutrients out of the leaves to use it for flowering, and then because those leaves are kind of uh, no longer have a ton of nutrients in them, don't have the necessary chlorophyll to operate properly, the plant sheds them. Um, so it might be a nutrient issue. You might try uh, fertilizing a little bit more. Um, typically, uh, plants need a little bit more potassium when they flower. So you could try a fertilizer that has, um, so typically fertilizer will, fertilizers will have three numbers on them. Um, it'll you know, be like a 206 or something like that. And so that stands for the nitrogen is the first number. Phosphorus is the middle number and potassium is the last number. So if you find something that has a slightly higher number at the end um, of those three numbers, that will give you a little bit more of a potassium boost. Um, and that might help with the leaf drop um, during flowering. But uh, just uh, make sure to follow the rates on the label because it's easy to overdo it with fertilizer. And then you'd have the opposite problem where uh, you end up with uh, fertilizer toxicity. So always make sure to read the label on fertilizer bags. More isn't always better <laughs> when it comes to fertilizers. Great. Thank you. And this person has two house plants and their leaves are turning brown from the tips moving to the middle of the leaves. They say that these plants look sad. Any thoughts? I'm sorry to hear about that. <laughs> that is really tough. Um, so for a lot of our, our more narrow leaved plants, um, a lot of our monocots, so if you think like dracaenas and spider plants, um, even sometimes um, diphobachias, um, but most, mostly dracaenas and spider plants are very susceptible to fluoride toxicity. So we have fluoride in our tap water. It's to help our teeth. It's good for us, right? But it's not so great for our plants, especially um, 
you know, specific monocots can be really sensitive to them. So one way that you can help reduce those sort of brown tips in those particular types of plants is letting your water sit out for about 12 hours before you water your plants with it. So you can just kind of fill up your watering can or whatever vessel you use to transport the water to your plant and let it sit for 12 hours, let it sit overnight. It can sit for longer. I mean, I fill up my watering can um, right after I water my plants and then I just let it sit until the next time I'm going to water so it's ready for me to use it. And then what that does is it allows the fluoride uh, to evaporate from the water. So there's less present when you're actually watering your plants with it. Um, that could be the particular issue. Um, another issue for plants um, with brown tips could be a magnesium deficiency. Um, so if you have any Epsom salts at home, preferably the unscented kind, um, you can mix uh, like a tablespoon in with um, your watering can like a tablespoon per gallon or so, mix it in with your watering can, and that will give your plants a little extra magnesium and sulfur, um, which um, can help with brown tips sometimes. That is good to know. Thank you. Um, so I've got another question here, which is, how do you recommend uh, people use those yellow sticky cards that you um, that we talked about with the fungus gnats at home? Um, is that a good way to monitor pests for houseplants? Um, yeah, so it's, it's good for your flying pests. So think fungus gnats, white fly, thrips. Um, thrips are a little bit more difficult to see because they're much smaller. Do you want to go to the, that slide of thrips? Yeah, so uh, this is a close up, but typically they're about, so this is a Western flower thrip. They're about like a millimeter long. So they're pretty tiny. Um, if you have a hand lens like this, so this has three different uh, magnifications on it, but you can get one with just, you know, 5X or 10X. 10X is usually pretty standard. Um, and that way you can see thrips up close. And so if you are using sticky cards to monitor your plants, what you'd want to do is take the sticky card, try not to get it stuck to you. They're very sticky. Um, and to use a hand lens properly, you want to kind of rest it against your cheekbone like this. And then you bring the card up to your face and kind of move it in and out until it's in focus. Uh, you can also do this with leaves too. So if you're looking very closely at your leaves for thrips or spider mites, uh, that's a good way to uh, kind of scout your plants and your sticky cards um, so that you're really seeing everything. Because if you're just looking at it with your naked eye, you might not see all the pests that are actually stuck to it, um, especially if your vision isn't, you know, super great. Uh, and I would recommend um, kind of putting them amongst your plants, so kind of in your plants, and then looking at them about once a week or once every two weeks. and um, if you don't see a lot of pests, uh, if you just see like one or two, what you can do instead of changing out the sticky card every time you look at them, you can take a marker or a pen or something and just um, put a little mark on top of or right next to that particular pest that you saw that week. So that way you know that you counted it already. And then when you look at the card again next week, you'd be like, okay, that's from last week. Here are all the new white flies or thrips or fungus gnats. Um, that way you can kind of see if, you know, whatever application you did is working. Like say if you have fungus gnats, you can count the fungus gnats one week, do put down some diametaceous earth, try out the nematodes, uh, try changing your watering habits, and then um, count them each week following that. And then that way you can see if, you know, what you did actually made a difference. Awesome. Thank you. Um, our next question is, this person has um, an indoor tree in a large pot and they're not sure when to water. So the top can get dry, but they're worried that the bottom is still moist and could cause rot. Is there any way to test the water level deep inside the pot? And should they make another hole in the pot to allow airflow? Um, that is tricky. So a lot of times when I'm, when I'm telling when I'm teaching interns how to water plants, 
I tell them to think about the plant to pot ratio, right? So if you have a really large pot and a very small plant, then that plant is going to need um, less water, so fewer waterings over time because it has such a large sort of volume to, to pull out of compared to its actual like leaf surface area. Whereas if you have a very large canopy in a very small pot, you're going to need to water it more frequently. All this is pretty intuitive, but it's a good thing to remember when you do have, say, a tree in a large pot. Does that tree have a lot of leaves? Um, if it only has a few leaves, if it's not super full, then it probably doesn't need a ton of, it doesn't need to be watered very frequently. So that can kind of be an indication of um, like, okay, well, I watered it last week. It's probably good for a couple of weeks, to be honest, if it's in a very large pot, it doesn't have a lot of leaves. Uh, what you can do is um, kind of tilt the tree over and look at the holes on the bottom of the pot and kind of stick your finger in the holes and see if, you know, the soil feels really, really soggy and saturated, then that's probably an indication that it doesn't need to be watered. If it just feels a little moist and the top is still, and the top of the soil is pretty dry, then I'd say that's probably a good indication that um, you need to water. Depends on the plant, right? Like tropical trees are probably going to want to stay a little bit more moist than, um, say, your avocado or something like that. But uh, yeah, it's it is tricky with larger pots, for sure. Thanks, Chelsea. And this person has a question about succulents. So when their succulents become soft and wrinkled, are they too wet or too dry? They've had this happen with plants that they've had for years and they think they're watering at the same level the whole time. So we're curious what your thoughts are. Yeah, so if they're soft and wrinkled, if say they're like, if they become slimy when you try to, when you touch them, then that's probably a pathogen. So that would be a disease. Um, and if that's happening, then um, you want to throw out that plant and make sure that you thoroughly clean the pot if you're going to reuse it. You know, clean it as you would a dish, you know, hot soapy water. If it's clean enough to eat off of, then it's clean enough to put a new plant in. Um, if say they're just kind of, um, they look kind of shriveled up like a raisin a little bit and they're still firm, then that probably, probably means that they need more water if, if you are letting them significantly dry out in between waterings. Um, it is tough because succulents, there are cacti that are from deserts, but there are also like semi-tropical succulents that are out there too. So, um, you know, one succulent may not need the same amount of water as another succulent. Um, and if you have moved the location of the plant recently, like maybe put it in more direct sun, um, then it might be drying out and need more water more frequently. Perfect. Um, this person is wondering about their uh, Dracaena. It says that, or they're saying that it's not very happy um, and they think it should be kept dry, but it's developing yellow spots and brown dead patches at the end of the leaves. Any advice? Yeah. So. You could try um, what I suggested before with the water. Uh, so letting your water sit out for about 12 hours or so uh, before you use it to water your plant. And that will help um, allow the fluoride to evaporate so that you can then um, hopefully reduce the fluoride toxicity that that plant might be experiencing. You can also use um, uh, distilled water, but that can be a little pricey. Um, just using tap water that sat out is typically enough to kind of help solve that problem and it might take a little while before you see results you know you're you're the the old leaves that have that symptom aren't going to magically heal you'll just see new growth that looks healthier um, if it's not that you could also try um, the uh, adding a little bit of epsom salt like i mentioned with the magnesium um, and typically with dracaenas they do like to dry out a bit in between watering. Um, so, you know, maybe letting the, the top inch or so dry out. It doesn't need to be bone dry. Um, and you will notice typically when a Dracaena um, is pretty uh, well hydrated, the leaves will be more um, kind of stiff 
And then when it's starting to wilt because it's uh, too dry, the leaves will flag a little bit. Um, so it's just kind of like being in tune with your plants and kind of keeping an eye on them. Um, typically also when plants are uh, too dry, they will be slightly duller in color. So they'll kind of look more dull um, than say when they're really well hydrated um, in addition to having that flagging. Great, thank you, Chelsea. Um, this person is wondering if they're they're out there and they're looking for the best possible indoor soil they can find, what attributes should they be looking for? Yeah, that's, that's a tough one because it um, depends on the plant that you're trying to use. But say you have a typical, you know, tropical or subtropical plant, you know, a typical house plant, um, you do want to look for a soil that has... Um, um, that's pH balanced. Uh, it'll usually say that on the bag. Most potting soils are pH balanced. So um, like for example, if it has peat moss in it, then it will have a little bit of lime to, to raise up the pH to a suitable level. You also wanna make sure that um, it has um, some sort of coarse material in it to allow for better drainage. So uh, perlite is a pretty common one. I'd say definitely avoid anything that has styrofoam beads in it as it's not very environmentally friendly. Um, bark chips are sometimes used instead for drainage as well. Um, so making sure that it's kind of a mixture of uh, various like fine materials like peat moss or core and then um, larger chunkier materials to allow for drainage like um, perlite or bark. And, uh, some part, some um, potting mediums will have kind of a starter fer fertilizer included in them as well, which is good, but just keep in mind that that's only going to last for so long before you need to fertilize again. And then also just kind of keeping in mind like buying uh, new fresh soil that hasn't been sitting out, doesn't have holes in the bag, isn't super saturated, things like that. Um, this person is asking, they have a slight white dusty coating on some of the leaves of their trees. They said it's subtle and it's not on all of them. What could it be and how could they address it? Yeah, so that sounds like powdery mildew uh, potentially. If um, I mean, it could be uh, hard water residue depending on you know how long it's been there um but if it's if it seems more powdery if it kind of looks like um try, like cotton a little bit versus like white spots um then it's probably powdery mildew and that that can be a little bit tricky um uh, baking soda is actually um uh <laughs> There are some products available on the market that is just basically uh, baking soda packaged to be a, a powdery mildew treatment. So you can actually um, use baking soda as a home treatment for powdery mildew. Uh, there are a bunch of recipes you can look up online um, for the particular rates of uh, baking soda. But um, typically if, if you are treating powdery mildew, um, you want to reduce the humidity around the plants and leaves and that will help and as well as the free moisture so you don't want like a lot of sitting water on the leaves and then also the the humidity needs to be a little bit lower and then that makes the conditions uh, where you're growing your plants uh, less favorable for um, the infection of the pathogen can you pull up the disease triangle actually So for there to be a disease on a plant, you need the pathogen, which you already have. You have powdery mildew, if that is what it is. I'm assuming that you have powdery mildew. So it's around. You have a susceptible host. So um, maybe the plant is getting a little bit too much nitrogen. So the leaves are a little bit softer. Maybe it's um, being grown in maybe it's being grown inside rather than outside, um, or maybe it's just that time of year, plants are flushing out a lot of new growth, so that new growth, which hasn't hardened off yet, is more susceptible to powdery mildew. And you need the proper environment. It's springtime in DC, it's spring 
everywhere in the northern hemisphere. So we have a lot of uh, moisture in the air, a lot of humidity, temperatures are warming up. Uh, we also have a lot of overcast days. These are all great, create a great environment for powdery mildew. So all of these factors combined create the disease on your plant. So in order to properly control the disease, you really need to address each one of these factors. Um, so you can spray uh, baking soda to help kill the, the spores of the pathogen, but it's going to keep growing and coming back. Um, so you need to make sure that you're um, providing the, the proper environment for growing. And maybe that will change with time if, if the plant's outside and, you know, summer will come along and the plant will harden off and then powdery mildew will, will be less of an issue. It does tend to be kind of a seasonal spring pest problem here. We don't typically do a lot of treatment for powdery mildew unless it's really bad, then we might spray, but it does tend to just be a seasonal sort of pest that we don't worry too much here about. Um, and so with using fungicides to treat for a disease, you're really protecting the new growth. So you have to do multiple applications. Um, so, you know, if you're trying to protect the new growth, then you, you probably want to spray um, once a week, once every two weeks, or after each rain event, things like that. Thanks, Chelsea. And if we're mixing up our own sort of baking soda concoction at home, is there a, a ratio we should try and keep in mind? Um, I don't remember off the top of my head what the rate would be for at home. I don't want to just make something up. So <laughs> I'm going to direct you to look around online. There's a lot of um, good uh, resources online and baking soda is pretty inert. So um, it's hard to uh, uh, screw it up too much. You know, the, the negative consequences of getting the rate wrong is too high. Um, and I think some of the resources recommend mixing it either with like um, mineral oil or a little bit of um, soap or something like that to help it uh, coat the leaves better. Great, thank you. This person is asking, how often should we be changing out our soil or repotting our house plants? Sure, yeah. So um, you definitely want to repot them if they're growing and they're getting too big for their pot and they're starting to become root bound. You definitely want to put them in a bigger pot um, or depending on the type of plant, you can divide them and kind of, you know, if you don't want to get a bigger plant, you can chop them in half. Um, if, you know, they have multiple stems, something like that, and cut in half and then just take half and uh, put that back in the same size pot with some fresh soil, give the other half to a friend or compost it, you know, whatever you want to do. <laughs> um, or uh, if say you have a pretty bad pest problem, sometimes changing out the soil can help. So say if you have really bad fungus gnats and you're noticing like some root rot on your plants, actually sizing down your plant, so putting it in a smaller pot um, and removing as much of the old soil as possible, even even potentially washing the roots, can help remove uh, the fungus gnat larva. It can help remove a lot of the rot that's going on in the, in the root ball. And um, putting that into a smaller pot uh, with some fresh soil may help solve your uh, root rot or fungus gnat problem because it actually allows the root ball to dry out more frequently because it's in a smaller pot, um, which creates a less favorable uh, environment for fungus gnats and uh, root rot. Um, if say you have a plant that's doing well um, and you know doesn't seem to have any issues, it's not getting too big, whatever, you don't need to change the soil. As long as you're fertilizing on a regular basis, the plant should be able to um, uh, live in that soil environment for a while. Um, the only issue with having a plant stand in pot for too long is that you might uh, start to see uh, pH issues. Uh, I had mentioned before that most uh, peat-based soil is pH adjusted, so they add uh, mineral lime to the soil. And over time, that will break down and kind of leave the, soil, the potting soil. It takes a while, 
probably takes a couple years for that to happen. Um, but it's just something to keep an eye out for. Like if you do have a plant and it's starting to show some like nutrient issues, some like weird looking chlorotic leaves, um, and it's been in the same soil for a really long time, multiple years, then yeah, it might be time to, to freshen it up and change out the soil. Great, thank you. Um, this person has Hoya plants, but they're having a hard time getting them to thrive. Um, they're saying they're using a grow light and they water sparingly and they use coarse potting soil. They're just not doing well. Any suggestions about Hoyas? Yeah, so if you're watering sparingly as well as having coarse potting media, then they might actually not be getting enough water. Um, Hoyas are actually um, uh, semi-tropical plants. So they, um, even though they have succulent leaves, um, and they, you know, don't want to be over water, they also still need a fair amount of water. So try increasing your watering frequency a little bit um, and maybe throwing in some fertilizer, some, you know, general use fertilizer, uh, because of course potting media tends to not hold a lot of nutrients in it. So uh, the Hoyas might just be kind of suffering from a little lack of uh, water and nutrition. Thank you. And our next question is, are there any beneficial insects I can release in my own home? Or are they mostly for greenhouse environments only? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I mentioned before about the nematodes that you can use if you are having uh, fungus snap problems. Those nematodes also can help with thrips as well. Um, so, it, you know, the Steiner, Steiner Nema Feltier, I can type it into the chat if you want. I think someone put it in there for us. We've got we've got an oh. app in the chat, so I'll uh, I'll make sure that gets repeated okay. in the chat. But thank you, Chelsea. Yeah, the Steinium Feltier, Those are those can be used. Um, they're pretty good for home growing environments. Um, you can also try predatory mites as well. So say you have two spotted spider mite. Uh, do you want to pull up the the close up of the spider mite image? There. So there are multiple. There are multiple species of spider mites out there that could be feeding on your plant. If you have a hand lens, you can take a close look at them. And if you see, can you see my cursor? No, okay. So, so if you see these type of spider mites and they're called two spotted because they have uh, the two dark spots on either side of their abdomen. So that means that you have two spotted spider mite. If that's the case, then you can use uh, Persimilis as a predatory mite for two spotted spider mite. Typically, you kind of have like a light to moderate infestation of two spotted spider mite. Um, if you don't know what species of spider mite you have, if it's not two spotted spider mite, then Persimilis is not going to work. Um, but that is one that can can work for the the home grower. Um, there are other predatory mites. Um, uh, Swirsky eye works for um, thrips and whitefly, typically, but that tends to they tend to need to be released earlier on, um, or say after you do a pesticide application to knock back numbers. A lot of these beneficials don't work that great if you have a really high infestation of a pest. You need to kind of either treat with uh, compatible insecticide, something that doesn't have a long residual, you know, like horticultural oil or horticultural soap. And then um, once that's dried, then you would release uh, the beneficials um, to help feed on um, and take care of any of the residual pests that may have survived um, your pesticide application. Thank you, Chelsea. Um, our next question, this person is asking, is it ever beneficial to soak um, rotting roots in a biofungicide? Uh, so typically biofungicides, um, the mycorrhizal products tend to only work best as a preventative. Um, you can try to use it as a curative. I would recommend um, actually removing as much of the rot as possible as much of the brown because those, those roots are dead 
anyway. So might as well get rid of them. That'll help reduce the amount of um, pathogen that's in your rhizosphere. And um, then you could try treating the plant, uh, the healthy remaining roots with the biofungicide. And then you might see some results. Again, kind of downsizing the size of the pot will help. Fresh media will help. Um, but if it's really bad, um, just make sure that you're, you're cleaning your hands in between, um, handling um, your rotting uh, roots and the, and the diseased plant. Clean your hands in between each plant. Um, and that's just a good rule of thumb for any home gardener. If you're pruning your plants, using cutting shears, um, sanitize your hands and your shears in between each plant that will help reduce uh, disease transmission as well as uh, pests too because you might not notice that one plant has spider mites so if you're picking off dead leaves and you throw them you know compost them and then you move on to your next plant without cleaning your hands in between you could be transferring spider mites from one plant to another without even realizing it because they're so small um, so sanitation is really important to focus on when you have pests and diseases, or just on a regular basis, making it part of your habit. Perfect. Um, this person says that they've got soil in a big tree pot and it seems to be settling. Is it appropriate to add more soil to the pot or will the soil get too heavy and compact the roots? So I would say that you don't, so with trees in particular, um, you don't want to bury the crown of the tree as that can cause uh, collar rot and other disease issues. So wherever the natural surface of the soil is, is what you want to keep. Um, so that the surface is going to be um, right below, it's, it's, the surface of the soil is going to be like right above where the roots are spreading out on the soil surface. So. Um, and typically there, it's like right when you'll see the first root coming out of the base of the trunk, right above that is the collar of the tree. So you want to make sure that you keep that collar free of, um, of soil or mulch and whatnot to make sure that you don't get any rot or diseases. What you can do is take the whole plant out and then add soil at the bottom of the pot uh, to help bring that back up. Thanks, John. See, this person is wondering, is there any importance of using organic fertilizer versus non-organic fertilizer? Um, it's a tricky one. Um, so if you're not growing food, probably not. Uh, it also depends on where the runoff from your plants is going. Right, so organic fertilizer is going to be less likely to, to pollute waterways. Um, that's not always the case. Um, really, the concern with uh, waterway pollution, so like rivers, the Chesapeake Bay, with all of our, I mean, the whole DC area is the watershed for the Chesapeake Bay which then flows into the ocean. Uh, the big concern is with uh, high phosphorus containing fertilizers. Um, so as long as you're not allowing any high phosphorus containing fertilizers run off into your gutters, into the storm drains, um, into your backyard, which would then run off into the rest of the watershed, um, you're probably fine, synthetic versus organic. Um, and just a reminder too, you, you'll know if it's high phosphorus because that middle number will be really high. So uh, it might be like a two, like 10, six would be the three numbers on the bag. That would indicate that there's a really high phosphorus content. Um, and typically plants don't need a ton of phosphorus. Um, so it's not necessary to have that number be really high. And honestly, sometimes depending on the organic fertilizers, organic fertilizers can actually have a higher phosphorus content than synthetic fertilizers. Um, but it's also not great to allow synthetic fertilizers to run off into waterways as well. So yeah, there's not an easy answer to that. Um, organic versus synthetic. 
it uh, with synthetic, you can at least um, be more targeted in uh, your fertilizer approach. Like if you know exactly what type of fertilizer your plant needs, then you can get a synthetic formulation that has those exact nutrients formulated for that particular plant rather than having sort of these excess um, nutrients that your plant might not need that say organic fertilizer would have. Um, and then excess nutrients means more runoff. But if you're just watering your plants in your house and it's going into, you know, your drain and your bathtub or something like that, it's not going to make a huge difference. Thank you, Chelsea. Um, this person is wondering, how do you treat cotton mealybugs on succulents? Yeah, mealybugs are tough. Um, on succulents, if they're indoor plants that aren't flowering, we've had the best control methods using um, neonicotinoids. I know that they get a really bad rap, uh, but they really only pose uh, a harm. They, are really only harmful to uh, pollinators um, if applied to plants that are in flower. So if you don't have any pollinators foraging on your plant, you can safely use neonicotinoids uh, to control mealybug. Um, imidacloprid tends to be a pretty good one. Um, you can find products that have that. Um, obviously, read the label, follow the label. The label is the law. Um, make sure you are buying things from a reputable source, go to your home gardening store. Don't just buy stuff off of Etsy or Amazon because they are not licensed retailers for those products. So um, you may be buying in something that you can't actually legally use where you live uh, because pesticides have to be licensed in particular states to be used in those states. So um, I would recommend going to your local home and garden store, talking you know, to their garden rep, finding something that works um, for that particular pest, uh, make sure that that pest is listed on the label of that particular pesticide, um, otherwise it might not work. If you have spider mites, do not use imidacloprid or other neonicotinoids as it can be, uh, uh, it's a product that uh, increases spider mite fecundity. So if you have both mealybugs and spider mites, it might kill the mealybugs, but then you have a spider mite outbreak because all of a sudden they're reproducing like crazy. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough on succulents. Um, if, you're, if you'd rather not use a pesticide, um, you can just try physical removal. A lot of people see success with uh, rubbing alcohol and cotton swabs. No, it's not a great answer, but they, they give us a hard time here too. Thank you, Chelsea. Um, if you're looking at your plant and you're trying to diagnose your issues, um, is there any telltale signs of distinguishing a pest problem versus a pathogen problem? Sure, yeah. So pests, you'll typically see the actual pest especially if you're looking closely at the plant. Um, you know, with fungus gnats, you'll see the adults flying around, spider mites. You'll see the spider mites crawling around on the undersides of the leaves. Um, thrips, you'll typically see them uh, crawling around in the new growth. Um, whereas with diseases, they, you won't see any signs of um, actual pests. Um, you won't see, like, frass or residue or any sort of, you know, um, old uh, exoskeletons or anything like that. So, and diseases tend to, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word, they tend to kind of affect the plant more evenly to some degree. I mean, sometimes it might just be one leaf or another leaf, um, but it, they, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, it would, I would have to say that with actual insect pests, you will see the insects themselves if you're looking closely. Worst disease is not so much. Thank 
Thank you. And we've got another question here, which is my terrarium occasionally grows mushrooms. Should I be concerned? Uh, depends on the color of the mushrooms. <laughs> so uh, bright sort of yellow mushrooms, almost, almost the, the color of this card. Um, that is uh, a fungus that feeds on um, peat moss and it's not going to be harmful to your plants. It's just kind of a decomposing fungus. So it'll just kind of decompose uh, dead organic material that's already there. They're probably just more of a visual nuisance than anything. Um, if it's another color, if say it's more of like a beigey color or something like that, then I might be a little bit more concerned, might be a sign of our malaria um, or another pathogen. Um, but typically mushrooms aren't too big of a concern. Um, I would just say it might be an indication of uh, too much free moisture. You know, maybe let your terrarium dry out a little bit more in between waterings and then uh, you might be less likely to get those sort of mushrooms. So thank you so much, Chelsea, for joining us today and for answering all of these amazing questions. And thank you to everyone who joined the program.